go what about an hour? Yes. An hour and a half. Okay. Now this uh, I have yet to be able. I haven't edited this yet. Uh, but this is like a two, almost a two-hour presentation because that's what the last time I did this was at Osher. So at one, some point I'm going to charge through some photographs. So uh, don't think that uh, I'm shortchanging you in any way. Okay. Uh, uh, where the the question as a historian that I always have is when do we actually? I want to get closer to you, but the microphone won't won't let me get any closer than this to you. I feel like I'm I'm talking so far away from you. But anyway. Um, the question we always have as a historian is, where do we start? And I remember when I was in graduate school many, many years ago, and if I was with my kids at school, I would say, and they had just invented graduate school. No one had ever gone to graduate school before. Uh, they think I'm that old. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I went to one of my professors and said, well, where do I start this particular paper that I was working on? It had nothing to do with Cement City, but where do I start? And of course, uh, as, if you've gone to college and you know how sarcastic and sardonic uh, your professor can be, he says, take me back to the Ice Age. So I always use this in a lot of my presentations. I, I want to take you back to the Ice Age. So travel with me back millions of years to glacial retreat in, in, the, in the entire southwestern Pennsylvania um, area geographically, and it leaves a lot of rivers and floodplains, and that's why we get Denora, and that's why we get all of these mills. It's absolutely perfect for industrialization. Um, but now let's fast forward to the ancient Egyptians. Now we're going to be talking about, as, as you can see, I gave, gave you guys a handout today. We're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, concrete and cement. Now, this, the, the, the ancient Egyptians are the ones that actually developed the idea of Portland cement. Now, Portland is a name that actually comes out of the 17th century, and that's out of Portland, England, where they have these great limestone fields. And I've already given you the answer to the key ingredient. The key ingredient in Portland is, you can say it, I'll give you half, half a point of credit. Um, and then we go, and then we travel a couple thousand years into the future, and the Romans decide they're going to add something to it, and they're going to develop something called ferro concrete. Now, everyone should know what ferro is, right? Iron, right. We're going to have reinforced concrete. And the simple difference, and we're, for our purposes, there are any number of grades of, of Portland. I mean, you can go to a Portland factory and get like 30 or 40 different grades of Portland. And, uh, but for our purposes, we're just going to use the, the term interchangeably concrete or cement. Now, the difference between concrete and cement is simply the Portland doesn't have, uh, excuse me, the Portland does have in it what? What's in concrete that's not in cement? Yeah. Gravel, slag, some type of an aggregate, that's, it. That's, that's what concrete actually is. Cement is something that doesn't have that additive in, uh, in, in it. Now, as far as building houses using Portland, it really doesn't start until the, the early part of the uh, 19th century in France. And it comes to the United States in the 1860s. And the guy that really starts to... to uh, to be attracted to the idea of building with Portland is Thomas Edison. Edison has several different motivations in mind whenever he's, he's doing this. He's looking at it as a capitalist because he has the Edison Portland cement uh, factory in um, New Village, New Jersey. Now he gets into the Portland cement business because Andrew Carnegie kicks him out of the iron ore business. If you know New Jersey, you know there are, there, there's a lot of iron ore, and there's great iron ore fields in New Jersey. But because Carnegie has everything, and all of, all of his cohorts have everything covered, else covered, uh, he gets kind of shut out of iron ore. So he starts, takes that equipment and uses it to develop Portland cement. So the, his main motivation, though, is to lower the cost of fire insurance. This is a time when we have these huge factories, like River Rouge factory in Detroit that's seven miles long. Remember the old JNL works that extended along the south side, and then uh, the and then into Hazelwood, and then the, you had the Homestead works, and you can just go right up the Monongahela River. And uh, all of these different factories had huge housing projects, and most of them were made out of wood. And so fire insurance was at a premium at that time, and it was costing it was costing those people a fortune in fire insurance. So he wants to lower the cost of fire insurance. He also is an altruist. He wants to develop 
um, housing that is going to be more livable and to eliminate slums and substandard housing. Uh, he wants to make the places more sanitary. Uh, a lot of these places don't have indoor plumbing. Uh, they don't have electric even electricity, let alone indoor plumbing. Uh, it, 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 the workers at this time are under incredible duress at home, and so they're not even, they're, they're basically sleeping at home and spending most of their day at work, then going to the club or the bar or whatever, and a lot of kids are, it's, it's just a chaotic situation. So Edison thinks that he can solve that problem by giving people good housing. So there's a bunch of social engineering going on here as well. Uh, this idea, and it's not a typographical error. No, that's exactly what the Republicans were in those days. They were the progressives. They were the ones that were trying to use the philosophy of government help, aid, to, to raise people up and out of poverty. Okay? So uh, whenever someone says today that the Republicans are the party of Lincoln, uh, they have no connection whatsoever to Lincoln. Lincoln would not recognize this Republican Party. Um, innovation and technology, we talked about that. And lastly, Edison is in competition with his fellow, um, his, his fellow industrialists. Now who played, think about the movies, when we've seen films about Thomas Edison. What, who, who played Thomas Edison? Who played old Thomas Edison? Do you remember? In the movies? Catherine Hepburn's boyfriend? Spencer Tracy, sure, he played old Tom Edison. And who played young Tom Edison? Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney, absolutely. We loved, we love Spencer Tracy. We love uh, Mickey Rooney. These are guys that have put, give, given Thomas Edison this aw shucks kind of just good old boy um, feeling. But Thomas Edison is as tough and rough a capitalist as there is in that era. He fits right in with all of those robber barons. Okay? He's not warm, he's not cuddly, um, he it has a tremendous feud with one of our locals. Remember? Who does he hate from southwestern Pennsylvania? George Westinghouse. Yeah, he hates George Westinghouse with a passion. Um, and so, and he doesn't like Tesla either because Tesla comes in and develops all this stuff and Tesla wants the credit. So Tom Edison is not the person that you, th I think you think, you, that you think you know if you've just watched him in the movies and heard a lot about his legacy. So he's looking to do this, leave a legacy, a gift to humanity. And his gift to humanity is going to be housing because he sees his good buddy Andrew Carnegie doing what with all of his money? Library, libraries, I usually don't talk with a microphone. Libraries, community uh, centers, all sorts of things he's doing. He's not even he's not even giving it to his family. He's just giving it away. And what would Henry Clay Frick? What, what did Henry Clay Frick famously say about this? Tom is trying to buy his way into heaven. Yeah, <laughs> Henry Clay. I I respect Henry Clay more because he knew where he was headed. Um, there is also the practical application uh, that, that Tom has to come up with. And he, again, uh, you can read just as well as I can read, uh, probably better. Uh, this, uh, th these are all things that he's going to try to attempt to accomplish. And I mean, this is an incredible social engineering project that he's taking under his wing. Not just an incredible building project. We're going to pass that up. And there's our hero, Tom Edison. He is with one of his... Um, one of his, uh, pro what, what we would call a prototype. Now, it doesn't look much like worker housing, does it? And it's not. It's not intended to be worker housing. What Tom is building, uh, basically, are mansions. He passes off the idea of worker housing to his subordinates. Remember, he has a whole team. He has, he has, he has multiple buildings of people working for him. He has hundreds and hundreds of guys that are under his employ. Um, this notion that Thomas Edison is just kind of tinkering with the dirty fingernails in the shed in the backyard, that's a complete and total fantasy. That's a complete and total legend. So he's got all these guys, and the, the two head draftsmen, uh, George Small and Henry Harms, are given the task of building worker housing. Now there's some bones of a um, uh, cement city house here, and if you can look and see, it's the and Mr. McCann's probably knows, can identify some of these things. It's the overhanging eaves, the divided light windows, a dormer on top. Uh, it's, a very, it's, a, it's, it's what's called an American four square. 
the, the idea of four rooms uh, uh, below four rooms. And this isn't his backyard. It still is there in West Orange, New Jersey. If you've ever gone to West Orange and seen his estate, uh, Henry Ford, of course, tried to move everything of Edison's to, to uh, Dearborn, Michigan. Um, and uh, some of the things that he didn't move, and this is one of them, actually. And again, this is another uh, prototype from, from Tom. He uh, decided that he's going Queen Anne this time. And so here we are at the Edison Portland Cement Factory. And as you can see, the, one of the primary things that you need after you get the Portland cement and you get the huge cement mixer up there, if you can, if you can notice that up there on the top, is you need forms. And so his first, his first forms that he developed were cast iron. And they're about four feet high by about two and a half feet across, actually about 32 inches, so you can get on 16 centers. Um, and uh, they're very heavy, and you need uh, uh, 30 people to, to put this up. You need to, have, uh, uh, you need to have multiple cranes. They needed to be bolted and nutted together. Uh, it, it's very labor intensive. And again, he's trying to lower those, those costs. And this, of course, is a new village. Now, Tom is, hit, his, is going Portland cement crazy at the, in the first decade of the 20th century. He's building all sorts of roads. Uh, the, the most famous thing he builds is in 1923, he provides the Portland for Yankee Stadium, the original Yankee Stadium, the house that Ruth built. But Tom thinks that he can cast everything in Portland. He can cast the chair that you're sitting in, in Portland. He can cast that table. He can make the plates that you're eating your, your snack. snacks off of, the cups, everything. Everything can be Portland, your bathtub, your sink, everything in your house can be, the framework can be Portland. And then of course you would upholster it and, and, and whatnot. And of course phonograph cabinets are natural with Thomas Edison, right? You, you have to have a phonograph cabinet. Now the first guy that actually takes up Tom and says, you know what, this is a great idea, We're gonna, I'm going to build my my factory worker housing out of um, concrete is this guy right here, Henry Phipps. Now we've all heard Henry Phipps' name, right? And Henry Phipps is famous for, right, conservatory. So he was a great gardener, right? See, and this is what I tell my kids when I'm at school. You have to remember, sometimes I'm just up here entertaining myself. So um, you can take yourself so long. No, he's. Henry Phipps owns, is, is one of Edison's main partners and advisors, excuse me, one of Carnegie's main partners and advisors. Um, he is in with Carnegie and Carnegie Steel, and he made a fortune doing that, so, so much so that when he, when he died, he left that conservatory, they built that conservatory for him. But he's, he's actually backing Edison on this. He's saying, this is a great idea, so let's, how, are we, how are we going to move it forward? So he has, Edison has to come up with an idea, and here's the idea, the first idea that he comes up with, and it is a failure. Now, if Edison were here, he would immediately jump up and say to, to me, what? I never failed at anything. I only learned... Oh, he never made a mistake. I only learned how not to do something. I only learned how not to do something. So yeah, no, yeah. Read up on Edison. He was he was tough. He was a tough guy. But anyway, now our mixer. Then we are lifted up into the forms, and it's going to just fall by gravity down. And you're going to what he called a monolith. He's going to pour in what he called a monolith. Everything is going to be connected. This would be an incredibly sturdy structure. This would probably could withstand a low-level nuclear blast, let, let alone a tornado or a hurricane. Uh, and of course he has a problem. His first problem becomes with the horizontals. How is he going to get that to flow evenly into the horizontals? And uh, eventually, eventually he solves that problem by going to uh, just a sit in, into three pores instead of a single pore. Now this is that particular technology in action at New Village, New Jersey. And again, you guys who know what cement city housing looks like, you can tell there's that's a cement city house, isn't it? That looks, Mr. McCann's, does that look like a cement city house? Similar. Similar? Sure, absolutely. You've got the overhanging eave. Uh, you don't have a hip roof, but you've got the shed roof. Uh, and, and of course, as you can see, he's got houses 
he's trying to pour in a, again he's trying to pour in that monolith and it's very very labor intensive it takes him roughly four years to build 11 houses something has to be done you can't you're not going to be able to change the face of america if you're going to build four houses in 11 years now this is ingersoll terrace in stewartsville and ingersoll we'll talk about mr ingersoll in a little bit uh and this is ingersoll terrace today well actually it's about oh gosh it can't be 25 years ago that I took these pictures yet, but yes, yes it is. Uh, that's how long ago I was there. Um, now this is Montclair, New Jersey. This is one of Edison's designs, and you can tell the difference. You can see the difference in the worker housing. There's a lot more detail in this house. There's even a garage in the back. This is at the, at the entrance to Montclair um, State University in New Jersey. Now this is worker housing of Edison's in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Are you getting the sense of a pattern here? He's building a lot of these around Jersey, which is right in his backyard, his own territory. You can see some shed roofs, excuse me, you can see some gable roofs, and you can see some hip roofs. Probably these were built uh, with uh, flat roofs. Uh, Gary, Indiana has the largest cement city. Uh, now what we're doing now is what my students hate. We're laying the foundation. I'm giving you the information with which you can then take and apply to Cement City and Denor. So this is the part my students hate. So you, don't, you guys don't look that happy either, man, I tell you. Anyway, so Gary, Indiana has the largest Cement City, and of course Judge Gary, the Gary Works and all of that. Now there's some very, very run down areas in the Gary, in the Gary um, Cement City, and there's some very, very nice areas in the Gary Cement City. Uh, it just depends upon where you live. It's a little bit more spread out than our cement city is contained within basically four, or excuse me, three basic streets and then two up and down, or, or, or um, up, yeah, up and down, uh, perpendicular to the river streets. Uh, and this is much more broad and spread out. Uh, individual housing is there as well as attached housing. Uh, this is another project of Edison's, although this is in Luzerne County here in Pennsylvania. It's, it's for a mining community, and you can see I'm, I'm using this picture to give you the example of one of the re ways that Edison is trying to overcome his problem with money. As you can see, it's in a nice big square, right? And here's the reason why. Because he lays down tracks, and he has puts his mixers on railroad tracks, and he's going to run them around until he can pour everything. Now, he's still using cast iron forms, but he's not pouring in a monolith anymore. He's pouring uh, in a um, in a, a, a three separate pour, and that there, there's the completed houses. There's these are postcards. I love love postcards. They just tell a great great story. One of the other things that these communities are doing is, is giving their um, their people uh, the people that live there their workers amenities uh, playgrounds. Uh, this is a waiting pool. For the, for the mining community. There was supposed to be a play, or excuse me, a waiting pool in our cement city as well, but they never actually got that built. Now there are a variety of cement cities around the country, and my rule of thumb is that if you have 10 or more houses, then you have a cement city. There are some places that have five and six of these houses, and the reason they only have five and six of these houses is because they stop building them because they just aren't cost effective at that time. They haven't, they didn't perfect it. As you can see, Gary is the largest. And then we have cement cities in other places, mostly through the Rust Belt. And Denora, Pennsylvania, 80 houses, the second largest cement city in the United States. Now here is uh, a, a, an aerial of Denora. I wish we were a little bit closer so you could see some more of the detail. Uh, but this is uh, down, this, this is the mill complex, the blast furnace, the open hearth, the wire works, the rod mill, the nail mill, the, um, and then the sink works, and then the acid plant. So this is Carnegie's vertical integration in action. You have a business district, a small very, very small residential district, and up in here, this corner, is Cement City. You can see how much more uniform it is than the rest of the, of the community. But I want to want, you, want to point this out, is that this was all supposed to be Cement City. They had envisioned building over 500 of these houses. They were going to start out with 152 and then eventually move up to 500. But they only stopped at 80, and we'll talk about why, that, why that, that's true a little bit later. Now this is downtown Denora. 
at the time that Cement City is being built. It is a vibrant, thriving, typical industrial mid Monongahela Valley town. Um, everything that you need is right downtown, and you can buy anything downtown. This is uh, the Roberts Building right on McCain Avenue, and this is typical of what's happening all across the United States. Uh, an entrepreneur comes in and he puts up his building. He has his business on the first floor, he lives on the second floor, and he rents out the third floor. This is urban industrial living at the turn of the 20th century, and this is going to be replicated everywhere in the United States. Um, but also the problem is that the workers don't have a lot of options. So they're putting up these two, two above two houses, two rooms on the first floor, two rooms on the second floor, probably no toilet, right hard up against the mill. Um, there aren't things like running water. There probably isn't electricity. Um, there are outside toilets. The runoff is going right into a stream. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot going on. These guys are working, remember, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. So there isn't a whole lot of options for them to come home and do gardening and landscaping and all of those sorts of things. But these are just houses in and around Denora. And I talked a little bit longer at Osher about this. And um, if you want to get the whole picture and not be here until 10 o'clock, uh, come to one of our walking tours that you see in the brochure there. But we're going to go through just some housing. The other thing is, people are living in multi-generational families. We tend to think in the 21st century we're kind of replicating this or we're breaking new ground with the 30-somethings or whatever coming home to live with their parents. Well, there's, it looks to me that there were at least three generations living in this particular family. And then just easy houses to put up, clapboard houses. Um, they probably, again, these early houses don't usually have restrooms uh, or bathrooms. They're going to have some type of um, outdoor plumbing. But dependent upon where you are in the social strata. Now, this is a little bit more upscale housing. Uh, this is where the mill uh, down toward 10th Street, if you're familiar with Denora, down toward uh, Heslop and then going up Thompson as well, where the mill built houses for the bosses. And not only the bosses, but the uh, superintendent. I went a little bit fast. Uh, that is eventually become the Spanish Club because what happens in 1916, 1917 is they built the zinc works. And when they built the zinc works, they learn very, very quickly that you don't live across the street from the sink works. You, and so they move. All of these guys move out and they give this uh, particular, uh, these particular houses away. And the Spanish bought that for a very, very low price. But uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the businessmen in town, the bankers, the lawyers, the doctors, they're building all of their big houses in and around Denora as well. Uh, but worker housing is something that they are, they are in desperate, desperate need of. So much so that workers are living in places like this. this is, these are what are called the bunkhouses down at the mill. And you don't bring your family, you come there as a worker, uh, they feed you, they put, up, they put you up for the night, and I would love to have a picture of what it looked like inside. Unfortunately, we don't have a photograph of what it looked like inside. Now, uh, usually we're a lot closer. So this is a newspaper headline from 1915, and it's asking people if you have rooms to rent. Denora has a huge housing shortage, and how are they going to solve that housing shortage? Uh, the Denora Mill, it's, it says there, now employs for 6,200 men. Eventually it'll reach a peak of about 8,000 men, but the population can't grow because most of these guys are coming by themselves and they're employing the hotbed method. Everybody's probably heard of the hotbed method, is that right? Someone want to tell us what the hotbed method is? It's, it's for general audiences. It's not something that's... Uh, <laughs> Right, three shifts. So you've got you you three guys get eight hours in the bed. Um, when they wash the sheets, I don't know. Does anybody know when they wash the sheets? Change the sheets? I can't imagine what I can't imagine what that's how what that was like. Anyway, so they do come up with in 1916 the mill is going to contract for a hundred new houses with a hundred more to follow. And the main ingredient, and it's probably too small for you to read, is going to be concrete. So immediately it gets its name, Concrete City. Look on your brochure, what do we call it? Cement, Cement City. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know why we do that either. It's actually concrete. The houses are indeed 
concrete. So the Denora project, you can read all of that up there. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Charles Ingersoll now. And he is, uh, along with Franklin Lambie, who is a neighbor of Thomas Edison's. Edison is, is wanting, remember, Edison is trying to create a legacy. He's going to give this information away. He's going to let pe other people take it, and he is going to develop all of the innovative um, ways to build with concrete, and he's going to give that away. And he, so Franklin Lambie, one of his neighbors, takes him up on it. But Lambie needs a little bit of backing, and so he gets backing from a guy by the name of Charles Ingersoll. Now Ingersoll made three different fortunes in his lifetime, but does anyone know what he made his first fortune on? Probably something that all of our grandfathers and great-grandfathers have had in their pocket. A watch. He developed the dollar pocket watch. Pocket watches were very expensive, and people prized their pocket watch. So Ingersoll figured, well, you know what, if I can get a pocket watch that I can sell to everybody, and they're very durable. You know, you see them today even on eBay for sale. An original Ingersoll pocket watch will go for somewhere between $750 and $1,000 today uh, in, in working condition. I mean, in, 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 there are a lot out there that aren't working and, need, and, need, and do need a lot of work. And the only other thing is that the Universal Portland Cement Company is going to provide the Portland. That's not Tom's company. <laughs> so he's a little bit um, put out about that. Uh, but it is a United States Steel Corporation company, and this is a United States Steel project, so monopolies you stick together, or oligopolies, or however you want to define them. Uh, there are three different builders. Lambie is going to be building, Aberthaw out of Boston, who had just built Braves Field in Fenway Park, and Nicola Building Company out of Pittsburgh, who had just built uh, Forbes Field. These are also highway construction companies as well. They are to, so they're very familiar with working with um, huge pours of concrete, and that's what we're going to need here in Denora, huge pours of concrete. Now it is basically prairie style architecture, and again, I'm not going to read all of this. You guys can do that on your own while I'm talking. Um, and at, at one time we had on one of our tours, we do these tours every uh, probably twice a year, and you can get on, look at denorahistoricalsociety.org, and you can get on one of the tours. We go into the houses, <coughs> excuse me, and you can um, really see the bones in the basement. Um, you can actually see how this construction goes together. Uh, but we, Edison has small and harms develop what, what is an adaptation. I described it as an adaptation once, and there was an architect in, on the tour. And he came up to me later and said, this is not an adaptation of Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie-style architecture. This is a total corruption of Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie-style of architecture. And so I gave him that. I mean, he, he was looking at the, the ideal Frank Lloyd Wright, like falling water, and the, um, oh, what was the house in Chicago? Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, right. Thank you. Thank, th th thank you. It's good to have people who know, know something in the audience. I, I, I deal with 15-year-olds all day, and they think they, think they know everything, but the, unfortunately, they don't. Um, so the, the idea of prairie-style architecture, because Frank Lloyd Wright, or excuse me, Thomas Edison said to Small and Harms, I don't want to be remembered as the father of ugly housing. So he wants to have something that has a little bit of style to it. And of course, it's going to be fireproof. It's going to have innovations. Like originally, believe it or not, they had gas-fired forced hot air furnaces that they took out 10 years later and put in coal furnaces. For whatever reason, whatever their reasoning was, I'm, I really haven't been able to figure that out. But it's, they want them to be so fireproof that uh, even the shingles are going to be impregnated with asbestos. It, and at that time, asbestos is the miracle building material. It's, it's in everything, and that's why we're having so many problems with these old buildings today, because everything has a coating of asbestos in, on, on it. Um, some of the other things, as you can see there, uh, in, and again, you can read the security patrol is interesting, because this, again, this is really technically not worker housing. What America's Steel and Wire wants to achieve with this first batch of housing is to get their mill foreman to stay in the mill. If you're a mill foreman, you are a skilled laborer. You are a top of the line 
um, worker and that you are very prized. That you can go to anywhere in the Monongahela, Ohio, uh, Allegheny Valleys and get a job instantly. But if you can't take your family to Denora and you are a prized, skilled worker, why would you go to, go to, to Denora to become a mill foreman? And they're finding that they need to, their mill foremen are, are turning over at a rapid pace. So we need to do something that's going to attract them here. So the other thing is a security, so that's why we have the security patrol. Now my father-in-law was growing up at this time and did not live in Cement City. Uh, lived on the other side of the track, so to speak, and they would try to sneak into Cement City. And he would always say they, that he was always kindly asked to leave. And, I was, and then, of course, I, I bit and said, how would they ask you to leave? They would stick by their foot up my <laughs> and they would excuse me from, from being in Cement City. It was a different time. The other thing that's kind of cool, uh, of all these other innovation or, or uh, te technological innovations that they're having in Cement City is the idea of the pencil sharpener on the bottom of the steps. Did you have a pencil sharpener at the bottom of your steps? Yeah, these pencil sharpeners, the, I, I have, since I have a duplex, I have two. And uh, they are still at the bottom of the basement steps, right onto the basement steps and uh, they work beautifully. A 101 year old pencil sharpener and it works like a charm. Now, Small and Harms come up with eight different floor plans. Uh, the, the most used floor plan in, on our cement city is a type 206 and we'll look at those. We're gonna get to pictures pretty soon, I promise. And uh, these are, this is the other distribution and they just, they just kind of picked these out. Um, I'm not sure if there was a real reasoning behind it, but these are just the different types. Uh, we have all of the blueprints at the Historical Society, so you could actually build one of these um, if you wanted to. There's just some samples of some, some pictures of some of the blueprints. Now Edison is also, while this is all going on, Edison is still coming up with ideas. And he comes up with the idea of the reusable adjustable steel panel form. And that's what this is. This is a horizontal form. And if you go into the basement of a cement city house, you will see this form uh, replicated right above your head because they're going to pour right on top of this. There will be some support underneath, and we'll see pictures of that, and there will be a rod that's running along here to create your joist from the next one because these are all just laid out. Very simple, you don't need a crane, you don't need three guys. Uh, a, a, a weak old 60-year-old teacher can lift this all the way above his head. Amazing, isn't it? And this is what Edison wanted. It's a thin gauge rolled steel. It's a huge improvement over the cast iron that he had been using before. So, um, now, the, now the vertical pores are uh, 9 inches wide and they're, they're also adjustable. Now we've never been able to find one of those yet. We're still kind of looking for those. He uses clips and wedges, no, no nuts and bolts. It's, there's, there's no tightening. So you put it, you, you set it up, you get it in place, you get it plumb, you get it level, and you're ready to pour. Uh, and then he develops what we call the high, he called the hydraulic derrick. And we'll talk about the mixture a little bit later. Now this is supposed to be Cement City in the early days. This is the first set of plans. And this is Pine Alley. Does any, everybody know where Dump Road is? Mr. McCann's knows where Dump Road is, I'm sure, but there, not too many other people. It's actually called Pine Avenue, and it was supposed to be included in Cement City as well. But whenever they got to those 500 houses, they were going to swing all the way around Pine and get up onto Bank and onto the other side of Cement, clear and back of the other side of Cement City. But of course, that's something that didn't actually happen. So this is Cement City, the corner of Modisette and Walnut in August of 1916 and they're starting to just put some things in place. They're starting to get ready. Uh, this is going to be on an 8.8 .8 acre parcel of land and um, you can see they're starting to dig some they're starting to dig some foundations. You can see some there's a, there's a terracotta Y just kind of laying there. I'm not sure what, why it's just laying there but it is. Uh, and you can see and again this is August 1916 the Lambie field office is there and they're starting to put up some forms. You can see them coming with some forms. Now they're going to use a variety of forms in Denora and a variety of plants. Now there are the verticals. There are the vertical forms there, nine inches wide and then adjustable length. So you can see the cement mixer there in the back and it's easy and to pour, isn't it? 
whenever we, when we're, we're above grade, but how are we gonna pour the first floor? How are we gonna pour the second floor? And that's where Edison comes in with this. Uh, this is the portable, he describes it as the portable um, uh, hydraulic derrick. And it's portable in the sense that if you tear it down from this spot and move it to that spot, yes, it is portable, but it's not on a track or anything like that. So it, it, it's a, the name is a bit of a misnomer. Now to pour, of course you need to have a footer, and we haven't been able to determine how deep the footers actually were. We're, we're assuming that they were probably about two feet deep, but some of these uh, implied looks to be like they are a little bit deeper than that. So we don't really know how much concrete is under our feet in a cement city house, because there's no real gauge to actually get down there unless you actually dig down under there to see how much concrete is actually there. So you can see some infrastructure going in, you can see terracotta pipes going in uh, on the back ends of the houses. For the most part, that's where uh, the, um, for the, for the most part, that's where the uh, wastewater is going off of the backs of the houses and the sewage water is going out the front of the houses, no, but not all of the, all of the houses. Uh, as you can see here too, this is the first, some of the first houses put up in Cement City and they're using wooden forms. So there were some wooden forms used in Cement City and they were used in a lot of places in Cement City. There's more wooden forms. Um, there are the vertical thin gauge steel rolled forms. You can see them just, there are three guys there putting them up. Maybe one of them is even a foreman. You've got some extra guys on the second floor uh, of, of that one. So uh, again, more footers. And again, those footers look relatively shallow, probably about two feet deep. In the background, you see the new high school that was built in 1915, uh, 1916, first opened up in 1916 and uh, it's just a short walk away. So again, this is something of a bit of a convenience. If you have a family, uh, it's an easy walk to the, to the local high school. That's not the 1931 high school uh, that uh, it is, is what most people remember. That be eventually became the junior high. So I'm gonna charge through these pictures um, until I get to a spot that I wanna yeah, stop here. Whoops. I want to show you as you can see, this, uh, this is about the standard in Cement City. This is probably where the fireplace is, so they want a little bit more uh, concrete poured into there. But this is the standard, about a seven inch pour for your walls and your floor. Uh, some are a little bit bigger, some are a little bit smaller. As you can see, the crew is relatively small. They don't have a lot of tools. All they need is a clip and a wedge and probably a plumb bob and a level, and just so that they get plumb and level and they're ready to pour, they're ready to go. Um, so Edison breaks it down. The pouring process is now three, three pours per house. And uh, it takes about 12 days. And what he's going to do then is he's going to put his workforce on the assembly line. They are going to go in there and put a roof on. Uh, electricians are going to go in, plasters, painters. Everything that needs to be done is going to be done by a team. And they're just going to go from house to house to house. And again, try to do this as quickly as possible. Now they used 10,000 barrels of Portland. Now 10, 000, a barrel of Portland at that time was measured by four 96 pound bags. And I'm not doing any math. I'm a historian for a lot of reasons other than the fact that I love it. Um, it it's that I'm not any good at math. I always thought that I would be a math teacher, but uh, I was disabused of that notion very, very early on uh, in, in my academic career. Uh, so. Uh, the thing that I want to bring your attention to is this, 123 yards of concrete per house. Now how many cement mixers, or excuse me, how much, how much the average cement mixer that you see running, rolling down the street, um, how many yards of concrete do you suppose is in one of those? And we got the, the guys got the answer there, about 10. On an average it's about 10 yards of concrete. So even with my limited math skills, I know that I need over 12 of those trucks just to build one house. That's a lot of concrete, folks. So actually, this is my house going up at uh, 729, 725 Chestnut Street uh, in Denora, Pennsylvania. And it's going to go up relatively quickly. And we see young kids coming, and they're watching it be built. And there's the frame structure of it. Uh, finally, you see the band courses, you see the windows, 
it's getting ready for people to go in and make it into a house. Now what you see in Cement City on the outsides of these houses today is not concrete. What you see is stucco. There's a layer of stucco on the outside. On the inside, they are either lath and plaster or they are an old-fashioned drywall that is very, very hard and very, very tough. The first time I, I drilled a hole in, in the drywall, I thought I was actually drilling in concrete until I broke through it about gosh, five-eighths of an inch, or maybe even more, close to three-quarters of an inch. It's really thick um, as well. They don't make drywall like that anymore. Uh, but there's the house, again, going up and being finished. So let's get to, oh, that's one that I want. Okay, uh, that floor pour. You can see our white-hatted foreman it hasn't changed, even now that today the foreman wears a white hard hat. In those days, he was wearing a white uh, straw hat. Uh, he's watching his crew get the floor ready. As you can see, some of the supports for the floor are there. And uh, he's actually standing on one of the forms that I just showed you. So he's standing on those forms. And they're going to lay a rod in there. They're going to pour right over top of that. Now, the other thing I want to show you are these, what they call knockouts. And that's for your electrical runs. That's for your plumbing runs. That's for your heating runs. Um, and anything else that you they wanted to put in the wall at that time. Now remember the service for electricity is going to be very small. You probably have two outlets, receptacles in your living room. You have one receptacle in each of the bedrooms, one receptacle in the kitchen, uh, and not much more, maybe one in the basement um, as well. So it, it's a different era. Um, all of our houses had to be upgraded with electricity. And you can see some of the finished houses going up Walnut Street. There are the floor, 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 floor form pour. Say that really fast a whole bunch of times. So, uh, mixing aggregate right out in the street. Uh, you see terracotta, you see trucks. Uh, and now we have this. What, uh, this is Edison's, of course, idea of the, of the derrick. Someone has to control all of this. And so the guy gets, climbs up there and he stands up there. The amount of uh, mud going through the sluice is determined by him. So there's probably some type of a signal. The other thing is there are going to be people on top of the wall with poles. And you can see, I think this guy has one, I'm not sure. And of course is the concrete, so there aren't any gaps in the concrete that it's, it's actually filling the cavity evenly. They're, they have to be pumping up and down. So this is incredible exercise, I, I would imagine. Um, I, I, would, I, I should get on one of these crews because I need to get back into shape. Uh, but anyway, there's the Derrick. And the, one, the unique thing about the Derrick, this is Monticet Avenue, by the way. Um, the unique thing about the Derrick also is that once you put it up, you can lay all these guide wires to it and then you can rotate the sluice at a 360 degree angle. So again, Edison is trying to come up with ways to speed the process up. How do we speed the process up? Uh, there you can see one house is already stuccoed, and the house next to it is not stuccoed yet, so the stucco crew has gotten there. This looks like painting crews, uh, and then now this is where we got bogged down at Osher. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge through these photos until I get to something that I like. I like this photo. Uh, because we have the mules, the draft horses, and they're working with mechanical equipment, 20th, 20th century equipment, and they're also working with 19th century equipment. But what I like about this picture is you can see the red smoke from the open hearth coming up. Now, being in the south, southern corner of Denora, it's, it's off the windward side, and what is that called, leeward or windward? Doesn't matter. Uh, but the prevailing wind is not blowing back into, into Cement City. So that's one of the advantages of, 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 of being in Cement City. And then we have some draft horses there. There are those big 96-pound bags of Portland. As you can see, there are no barrels here. That's, the barrel was used as a measurement. There aren't any actual wooden barrels with four bags of Portland um, in them. And you can see houses going up. And we just have an incredible collection of these houses. And I want to be finished uh, in, in due time for you guys. Uh, one of my favorite pictures. This is one of my favorite pictures. I made an entire story, an entire scenario up about this. In 1916, 1917, Pennsylvania had something called, you remember this, 
because I grew up with them, them, them as well. They affected me in the, growing up in the 1960s. The Pennsylvania Blue Laws. Do you remember the Pennsylvania Blue Laws? Yes. And one of the things the Pennsylvania Blue Laws basically said is you cannot do production on a Sunday unless, of course, you are Andrew Carnegie or somebody like that, that you can do anything you want on a Sunday. But for the most part, you, you, had to, you, had, you couldn't work on a Sunday. So they, this is a day off in Cement City. And Bruce Driesbach, who is the official mill photographer, he's the guy who took all of these photographs that we've gathered up over the years, um, is up there taking photographs of, of uh, Cement City. And after church, this little girl right here, and I, I have named her Juanita, uh, is there with her family. They just had a picnic lunch over at Palmer Park, and they walked now to, to here to see this incredible building site that they, ha they have. And Mr. Driesbach grabs her and says, Sweetheart, why don't you stand out here, and I will take your picture. And now we are looking at her 101 years later here in Bridgeville. Are we... Technically, we're in Bridgeville, right? And there she is. She is famous. And I love the bow, the bow in her hair. And she just looks great. Now, that is um, what's called historic fiction. None of that, I have no idea if any of that is true or anything. But that's, that's the great license I take in terms of making up stories. So I'm pretty good at making up stories. Um, but I'm not making this stuff up. Just that. Uh, the bathtubs are in. Everybody got a clawfoot bathtub. So let's get to the point where we're going to meet some finished product, and we're going to meet Mr. and Mrs. Cement City. Oh, here we have. We're going to have a couple compare and contrast. Now this is Sheer Alley. This is taken. Um, this would be taken from just about where George Saxon's house, Mr. McCann's, is built, and looking down that particular alley, and you can see. The uniformity. Uh, it's, this is not what Edison was looking for. He wasn't looking for this sameness. He was hoping to get a little bit more diversity uh, in his houses. And then there's the same shot today taken from Mr. Saxon's porch. Um, the late Mr. Saxon, who was the mayor and uh, did a variety of things in Denora uh, and was famous for being my next door neighbor. Um, and then there's the maintenance shed. Now remember, these houses are not sold. These houses are owned by American Steel and Wire, and they're renting them out. So anything that you needed done in your house, you went down to the maintenance shed. It's still standing today. Um, there it is. And you told them what your problem was. Something as simple as your light bulb in your lamp is out. They will come and change the light bulb in your lamp. They did everything for you except for actually clean the house. All you had to do was clean the house. So... Uh, and it was relatively expensive, actually, to, to live there. Now, Edison still has a problem. To build one of these houses costs about $3,300. If you want to build a similar wood frame house, it's going to cost you about $2,100. Now, I'm not a math major, but I can see that to us today, that doesn't look like a huge difference. But think about it in terms of maybe being, this is a $33,000 house, uh, or excuse me, this is a $300,000 house and this is a $100,000 house. So what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You've got to look at your finances. Uh, the rent is relatively expensive. For the biggest ones, it's $42. For the smallest ones, it is uh, $22. Uh, it's a, at a time when you could rent an entire house for $10 a month on, the, on an average wood frame house. Uh, so the total project cost was $300,000. And if you want to build one today, replicate that house today with the same materials in it, it's going to cost you about the same cost as 1917 to build 80 of them. So today it's about $300,000. And then everybody wanted to come to Cement City. The New York Times came and did a story. Popular Mechanics came and did a story. Engineer societies and architectural societies and students, a lot of people came to Denora to come and see what this Cement City thing was all about. And uh, this, this, again, we're going to do a little bit of the past and the present. Um, this is a duplex, a 209. It's one of the bigger duplexes. And you can see some of the details that, that Small and Harms came up with. The idea of putting these pergolas out there. The pergolas are long gone. Uh, different divided lights. You can see there are six, six over one here, uh, and you've got nine over one here. 
Uh, some have dormers, some don't have dormers. They're just trying to break it up so there's a little bit of differentiation in the house. And then there's this house today. Someone has taken in the, on this side, they've taken in the front porch probably for some type of living space. It just doesn't have the same feel, the same character. Um, there's one of my favorites. It's a 203. And you've got living space above the porch and on the side of the porch. It's not a standalone porch, so you're not wasting any space with this house. It's very efficient. Uh, I love the windows, the tripartite, uh, then the multi-divided glass on either side. Uh, just a great, great window. And there's that same house today. Um, it doesn't look too bad, but uh, the other one, I think, just has a little something that you just can't describe. Now this is the 202, this is the other really big one, and it has a bump out. But I show you this picture uh, here because this is one of the storm sewers. And the storm sewers are still in place in the backs of these houses. They're a poured concrete, uh, and, if, and, and I haven't seen many with a lot of cracks in them. And the storm water, the, the, the rain water still comes off of the roof and then down these, these sewers um, to, um, to take the rain water away. Uh, now, these are the two sample houses that we actually go into, and that's what I would be telling you if we were on the tour. I would say, we're going to go into this. This is a 214. This is one of the ones that I made into a single, and then this is the 206. This is the one that is basically the standard in, in Cement City. There are 30, uh, one of them. There's another t example of the 206. And finally, we get to meet Mr. and Mrs. Cement City. Uh, here they are in front of their 206, the most, uh, the most built house in, in Denora. As you can see, um, by this picture, she is not really happy to be here. But because, one, I think one of the reasons is because the mill, anything that she wanted to put in the ground, she wouldn't have been allowed to. The only thing that she can do, as far as plants are concerned, uh, is put them into flower boxes or to pots. You didn't dig in Cement City in those days. Uh, you didn't uh, plant a garden. You didn't plant flowers. Uh, you, you, just, you didn't have to cut the grass either. So there, you know, it's a trade-off. You didn't have to rake grass. You didn't have to do anything. All this guy did had to do was to be a mill foreman. That was his job. And they took care of him very, very well. Of course, they charged him a really high rent too. But um, the other reason that they, and this is the big reason. This is the big reason. These people probably, this gentleman would not be here with his big family in Cement City if it weren't for the idea that he could get housing for them. Now we found uh, this postcard on the internet and we think that this is Modisette Avenue and we think it's 121. It's Modisette because there are no cement houses on the other side and they're in the back. And then we found this postcard. Uh, so we think that this young lady is named Hilda Hausler and she went to Washington University in St. Louis because there's 121 Modisette Avenue. So we think that that gentleman is Walter Hausler. So I think that's kind of cool. The postcard to the daughter who went off to college, which was really, really unique in those days. Number one, a lot of kids didn't go to college. And number two, a lot of women, even more women, did not go to college. Um, very, very few. So this is the interior of a uh, cement city house. Now naturally this is a posed uh, or a propped picture, uh, but let me point out a few things. The wallpaper, the, um, the picture rail, and then the color of the paint on the ceiling. Uh, those are all things that would have been chosen by the company. So if you come in with all of your furniture, your carpets, your drapes, and they clash with this wallpaper, it's no concern to American Steel and Wire. They choose the wallpaper, you don't choose the wallpaper. Even if you wanted to buy the wallpaper to change, they are going to tell you no. They own the house, they are going to tell you how to live in the house as far as anything structurally on the house goes. Uh, you can see that they are using the picture rail, you can see the wires hanging down. Uh, now look at the gas grate. Now remember, these are gas-fired uh, heating systems at this time. It's not coal. Uh, the grate on this one is a little bit different. The wallpaper is a little bit different. It's just basically hit and miss, whatever the decoration actually is. And there are a lack of receptacles. You can see an extension cord going down to that lamp, and then there's a, some type of an adapter up in there, which is kind of neat. Uh, this is probably a girl's bedroom. If you can look below the bed there, you can see a bit of a cradle. And again, wallpaper doesn't matter to them. 
Now, this is an upstairs sitting room. There are no closets downstairs in, some, in a cement city house. There's only one closet per bedroom, and it's a very, very small, shallow closet. So you have to add closets. As I know the McCann's added closets, because whenever, in 1984, when my wife and I were looking at houses in Cement City, because my wife was uh, born and raised in Cement City, uh, and I couldn't believe they built houses that close together, we did look at the McCann's house. And I said, you know, it's nice, but I can't live in a house where I can't do this between the houses. I mean, it, they, they are literally that close. So. We, 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 we passed on the house. Um, but anyway, so this is a closet door because I can tell by the latch and the corner beads uh, that, 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 give, that gives it away. This is some original bathroom wallpaper. There was a big renovation done a couple of years ago on Ida, and that's when we got the form, and that's when we got this wallpaper. And uh, it was actually reversed. Uh, the fish are on top, and then the, then the pattern's on the bottom, and this was in a bathroom. So if you didn't, and, and again, if you didn't like this in your bathroom, uh, American Steel and Wire was not concerned. So a lot of kids at the playground, was the playground still there when you were around? Up the top, and this is up on top of the hill uh, along Helen Avenue. Uh, they put the playground up there after they decided they weren't going to build any more houses. Originally, this was all going to be more cement city houses. Um, and then they decided, well, we're just going to put our playground up there. So we have, uh, we have picnic pavilions, we have swings, we have seesaws, we have all sorts of things going on. Uh, we have kids climbing things that are incredibly dangerous, uh, but there's, you know, n nobody's really regulating that. And you guys are too far away to see this, but the best part of this picture is that there's a young man here, and he's holding his little white shaggy dog. So it, it, if you want to run up there and take a look, you certainly can, or I can show it to you uh, a little bit later. Uh, the other thing is, cement, they, were, they were providing you with everything. They were even giving you an ice box. Now, if you wanted to buy one of those newfangled electric refrigeration units, you know, refrigerators, um, you could, and they would pay for the electricity, but they would bring you the ice for your ice box. And here are the kids waiting for a chip of ice in the summertime, classic Americana, where the idea that even a chip of ice in the summertime back at this time was a real treat. I, I can imagine telling my, my kids, you know, whenever they were kids, uh, oh, here's a chip of ice, this is your treat for today. Can you imagine telling your kids that? Um, they also had all sorts of in-house in social club things going on. They were called silver check men because their checks were silver while other checks were different colors for different departments, for labor, uh, for middle management, for upper management, uh, for office workers and that sort of thing. So they had softball teams, they had card clubs, they had bocce teams, um, they had, I know they had a basketball team. Uh, there was just all sorts of things that these guys did together until 1943. 1943 is the transition year, and American Steel & Wire got out of the housing business and sold all 80 houses in a lot to John Galbraith Company. The same John Galbraith that used to own the Pirates, if you remember him. Uh, huge industrialist, huge mogul, and he bought the houses on average. The average cost was about three to $5,000, and, um, or excuse me, he sold houses uh, on, on an average for three to five thousand dollars so he they were probably about where they were whenever they were actually first built now the current can value depends upon um, where you're living in cement city the condition of your house the upgrade of the house that sort of thing you might get seventy thousand dollars for a cement city house you might but not much more than that these are the original uh, proposals to purchase the, the, the original sale deeds uh, that they had, and I use this one because this is George Bowers, and he bought his house at 157 Ida Avenue in 1944, and in 1948, George Bowers is going to be one of the victims of the smog disaster. He is going to die over the course of that weekend during the smog disaster. But now that American Steel & Wire doesn't own your house anymore, you've got to get in that backyard, and you've got to cut that grass, and you've got to plant things, and you've got to take care of things. Now here's the guy that taught me everything I know about, about Cement City, Mr. Glenn Howis. 
uh, was a metallurgist at the mill for many, many years, uh, was my neighbor. He lived a little bit about halfway down on, I live on Chestnut, he lived about halfway down on Bertha. And uh, he's showing you his front door that has not been painted white, which a lot of, a lot of uh, things in Cement City got, have got painted white. Uh, we were fortunate when we moved into one half of our house was still a lot of the original southern yellow pine that was stained, a shellac and stain. Um, this, as far as I can determine, her son is going to break her record in a couple of years, but this is Mrs. Bush. Mrs. Bush was the daughter of a mill foreman, was born in Cement City, lived in Cement City, married a mill foreman, stayed in Cement City her entire life, passed away in 2003, I think, 2002, 2003. See, when my wife's here, she always tells me all these little details. That of, of, uh, to, to make sure. But anyway, she's the longest running resident. Now her son, who is pushing into his 70s, um, in, in his, probably his mid-70s, uh, may break her record because he still lives in Cement City as well. And of course, we have to have a celebrity from Cement City. And as much as I want to be a celebrity and Mr. McCann's wants to be a celebrity and uh, you know everybody else wants to be a celebrity, we have celebrities from Cement City, at least one. And that is, of course, Trudy Carson, who was, as you can read all of these things, a Radio City Music Hall Rockette, um, a June Taylor dancer, she was in the movies. And one of the things that I, I don't have to do today is I don't have to explain who Soupy Sales is. Because when I do this for a younger crowd, uh, much younger than me, too, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not excluding myself from your age group, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, they look at me and they say, who's Soupy Sales? Why is that important? Why is that interesting? But the, yeah, that's who she was married to. So, and, we, and we do go to her house. Now you can take pictures of Cement City uh, that makes Cement City look very, very nice. I mean, that's really nice. There we are on the tour. Uh, we're at, in front, standing in front of the maintenance shed. This is about five or six years ago. Uh, and um, just to show you that we do things like that. And we have more pictures of Cement City, more tour pictures of Cement City. There we are at my house in the driveway. Uh, now there I am at 215 pounds, and as I stand before you today, I weigh 187. It took a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, but after I saw that picture, that's when I started. But anyway, that's my house. We do go into that particular house as well. Um, and again, we can take pictures of Cement City and we can get really, really nice pictures. Now, I could add a bunch of pictures that you would think, I don't even want to go there to drive through Cement City. I mean, there are houses in that bad of repair. So, um, this is the last house that actually had asbestos impregnated shingles on it. Um, this is around 1988, and I took this picture. Uh, on the ground is the uh, roofing crew, and I said to the foreman, I said, you know those have asbestos in them, right? And he said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, well, are you, is that, are you, is that going to change your mind? Are you gonna, guys going to get you know, some type of safety equipment? Or, no, we're just going to tear it off. So I grabbed a couple of the shingles, and I wrapped them in he heavy-duty plastic, and they are at the Historical Society. And some of these barrel tiles, too, these seam barrel tile things, I got a couple of those as well. Um, but uh, that was the last asbestos in Cement City. Now, this is a house that is in incredible disrepair, and I'm hoping to get this storm door. There's an original storm door there that looks like it only has one coat of white paint on it, so it might be easy to restore. Uh, and again, here's the white paint problem. When you go inside all of these houses, you have a lot of white paint on top of that beautiful southern yellow pine. And uh, windows and things like that are very, very labor intensive. As you can see there, especially these windows, uh, you've got these divided lights and they are single pane glass and they are individual panes of glass within each one of those mullions. And then there's the thing that I'm always looking for, uh, some type of a chandelier. Uh, these are few and far between in Cement City to try to find them. Now we got our National Register of Historic Places status in 1980. Uh, 1998, and it was a high school student who was doing it as a project, but he got two professionals to help him do the project, but we got on the National Register of Historic Places. 
Uh, now that's a Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission marker, and then we're supposed to get one of these Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission markers, as well as Pennsylvania Department of Transportation markers at the bottom of the hill in Cement City, uh, but that hasn't happened yet. We have a lot of future challenges in Cement City, and the biggest one is the fact is the absentee landlords. Um, when you can pick up a house for $5,000, put a little bit of money into it, and then get $500 a month rent out of it, uh, and then just basically walk away, it's, it, it, it's, it's actually very inviting. So that's our biggest challenge. But the other thing is we have small lots, we have narrow streets, uh, we really, our borough is just strapped to the max as far as solving all sorts of problems with other housing in town. Uh, there's just a lot of things happening. Now, concrete hasn't died. Edison, of course, would have said he learned how not to do something. He gets out of the concrete business relatively early, uh, probably shortly after the Cement City project. But Lambie keeps it going until about 1925, and he gets out of it as well, and then they're finished. This is Gulfport, Mississippi. And when the hurricane went through there a few years ago, when they rebuilt, they rebuilt with concrete. Now, this is not poured in place concrete. This is prefab concrete. And it's able to withstand a Category 5 hurricane, and that's the standard that they were looking for. So that, and that's a relatively attractive um, house. Uh, and then, then this is a history hunt. If you come on a walk with us, I'm going to give you a list of things to look for. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to just stroll around and I'm going to entertain you. You're going to go out and find stuff for me, and uh, that's one of the things we're going to do. We're going to find Elwood fencing. That's one of the. That's just an example. Um, and then these are the directions to how to get up to Cement City. It says we're not going there tonight, you don't need those. And that's going to be it for Cement City uh, tonight. I think I did pretty well. I didn't, I didn't get too extemporaneous. But uh, I, I want to invite any questions, comments. Um, hopefully we can answer those. And if you don't have any, I want to thank everyone for coming. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Is there rebar in it? The only rebar is in the horizontal pores, on the floor pores. Uh, on the side pores, I was told by an engineer that the tensile strength and the weight that's pushing down on it, as long as it's connected, you don't really need any rebar on those vertical, or, on those vertical pores, those, the, those wall pores. But uh, yeah, there is rebar in it. Um, and according to one engineer who saw some of the exposed rebar, he said to me one time on one of the tours, we got a lot of people on tours telling me all sorts of good information uh, that the, that report is too small. It needed to be bigger. So, how they get the concrete up to the top of the derrick? Some type of hydraulic pressure. I, they pumped it up, and then they just let it run down. And then they run it through the sluice. That includes every street. That's, that, that, this became the popular way to do it. The Derrick is the way that, that Lambie did it up until 1925. I saw a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. I don't remember. Edison, No, that's why he got out. Um, he, he sold it, he kept his Portland business until, until he, he died. Uh, but he got out of uh, designing the housing. He gave away all of the technology, like you know how to how to do this brief, uh, this uh, thin thin gauge steel roll, this thin gauge steel, and you know how to pour in the derrick and all of that uh, that idea. He never kept that as a patent for him to make money off of. He did give that away, but nobody was really using it anymore after Lambie left in 1925. Years ago, um, I was places still pour foundations. In fact, that's become a very popular thing to do now where you where the where the form actually becomes the insulation for the house and you and you don't even tear the form down. It you put the form up and it's it's the insulator because uh, as far as an insulator, this is a very weak insulator, but it does 
once you heat it up, it is able to, the concrete is able to hold the heat a little bit longer than, say, a wood framed house would or something like that. And, they're, and, the, and in these days, they're not, cons in those days, they weren't concerned about energy. I mean, if, if you wanted to throw another shovel of coal in, that was no big deal. Um, we, they weren't energy, economically energy uh, conscious at that time. Okay, I saw one more, two more. Uh, well, it's just like, um, uh, with all due respect, it's just like your house. Uh, your house is not what it is on the outside, is it? On the inside, you have you you, you have air cavities, and uh, you probably have insulation in your house where we don't have insulation. And then you have some type of uh, 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 lath and plaster, or you have some type of drywall or something like that. Um, it, no, we're. We're not living in a house where we walk up to the wall and we touch concrete. It's it's not like that. Just like you're not living in a house where you you live in a what do you live in a brick house a, 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 a brick house right? Do you walk up to the your walls and touch brick? No, no. See, this is just like we're living like everybody else is too. It's just that the, the structure underneath what's probably brick and studded studded out walls at your house is concrete and studded out walls at my house. Yes, sir. Um, you said originally you were saying that you had you drill through the stucco inside the house. Uh, the, the drywall. Yeah. No, there's no stucco inside. The stucco is on the outside. It's okay, a it's an old fashioned drywall that's probably like three quarters of an inch thick, okay. and it's very very hard. And and they put that on to put the wallpaper on. Right. Okay. Now some of them are drywall and some of them are lath and plaster, and it depends upon. Whether it was Aberthaw that built your house, or Lambie built your house, or Nicola built your house, so they were they, they 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 were kind of contracting it out to three different companies. There. Why would you put lath on on a brick wall? There's no bricks. I mean cement wall. Well, they would, you would stud it out. There would be a stud, and then you would put your lath, yeah. and then you would then 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 you would go ahead and do your plaster. There's a cavity there that you can't really get to. Is that, By the way, am I not explaining this too I'm, well? I'm, you just, I'm thinking about on other houses when they put the lamp on. It's like a open area, and they put it on the outside, and they put the uh, drywall on. Right. Yeah. yeah, the plaster is going right on top of the lamp. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, you, they make concrete out of cement. Cement is. You, you have a concrete sidewalk, you have a concrete wall, but you never have a cement wall. Cement is cement, that's the, the Portland cement that you use. It's the gluing. Right. But you can't have a cement house. Right. Okay. But we're still, we're, we're not changing the name. No, I understand. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, and if that's it, I want to thank you for inviting me, and uh, uh, I appreciate being here. You want
Robert Bjorgi married Anna Fike, and they had a business in Denora on the main street. So this packet is for you. Okay. Thank you. And there is a thing, a hitch. There is a check from me, from my family, to use as a memorial to the wives and the Bjorgi family. Okay, so thank you. We, we do have a memorial fund uh, that we put money into. And then whenever we do something with that money, we do notify the family. So. As you know, Penny brought me in there for the first time. I She's remember Penny, yeah. Penny's a tough, tough, tough young lady. Imagine she, naming your girl Penny Wise. <laughs> she, she corrected me on a lot of my typographical errors on my presentation years ago. <laughs> She's still trying to tell us how to live our lives. Oh, well, she didn't go that far. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. That's Thanks, it, folks. Oh, 20 is 50 50 raffle. Visit.